Okay, let's uh, start the next talk. So it's uh, from Carsten Gebert. He's um, I've been talking about that. He's um, working together with colleagues that provide uh, that work on a visual thing. And as how I understood it, his job is basically to provide services for them, provide um, and. Uh, out of this combination comes the requirement to target the .NET platform. And um, he's doing these services in F Sharp, and he's uh, showing us how he's um, using Nix in this context. Hi. <laughs> um, yes, this is basically, I should probably begin by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Carsten Gebert. I work for a company called and Sync GmbH, that's a very small company here in Berlin and Frankfurt, in fact. And we, uh, I should probably say, uh, this, if you want to look me up, <laughs> that's how. Um, so I work for this company and I have a background in, not in computer science, but uh, actually in the arts and music, but I later came to realize that computing is much more fun and <clears throat> went on to uh, uh, become a programmer and ended up uh, yeah, in this um, whole web programming thing. But uh, recently I changed uh, jobs to this company. And basically what um, we are doing there um, is, oh, actually maybe I should continue. I, I'm really into functional programming, obviously. That's uh, kind of why there was this little cute lambda thing. Um, uh, mainly because I went actually to the Netherlands last last year for a course in uh, in Utrecht in um, uh, to learn Haskell, and that so that was actually a pretty excellent experience. Um, mainly interested in systems programming nowadays, distributed computing, uh, a little bit of the web, not as much as I used to, and um, audiovisual, um, yeah, that's, that's actually quite interesting to me. And uh, yeah, I only recently started to use NixOS properly. I tried it out, uh, I think it was a year ago, and then I had to had to give up because uh, it, I just couldn't really I didn't have the headspace to figure it out for myself. So, but yeah, so I'm a very new um, user of this, and so uh, it's very interesting for me to have seen all the talks already. They have been very enlightening. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to talk about the company that I work for. Basically, uh, we. Uh, our main uh, business uh, domain is the uh, is um, exponents or uh, yeah, how do you say it? Uh, you, um, you have uh, fairs and you put little pieces of um, yeah of interactive uh, inter installations that people can play with, and um, we put together these exponents as well as we. We make shows in this particularly um, interesting but weird little programming language called VVVV. Uh, there you can see a little screenshot. It's, it's visual programming. So you connect the boxes to uh, wire up the logic and um, then you can see uh, it uses DirectX to render stuff. Or oh, it can use anything to render but mostly DirectX. And so... My job in this company is not this. <laughs> uh, it's uh, actually I write, uh, or I'm the only programmer. I work on a system that integ integrates with this uh, programming language to basically uh, create and and run um, shows out of. Basically, uh, so uh, this is this was this year's um, uh, international auto. Uh, uh, ERR in Frankfurt, it's like the big uh, car fair. And uh, you can see on the screens that was like a 16 machine installation where we ran um, uh, this installation for Audi, which is the press, which was 15 minutes of full on 16,000 pixels in a um, wide. So it uh, was quite a nice installation. But yeah, everything in Windows, unfortunately. 
but um, <laughs> this is actually, but now that I know that that there is um, support for Windows and uh, I have heard about this Nix, it's um, actually, this uh, looks like uh, the way forward to uh, deploy our things. But anyways, yeah, so this is the, this is kind of what we, uh, what we do um, and yeah, uh, Okay, so what I'm talking, what I'm, uh, I would like to go over what I, I'm going to do now is basically, I think I, uh, I proposed this as a talk about microservices, but and deployment, and, and then I realized, hey, actually, um, developing um, with the .NET platform on Nix is, ac is actually, you can do it, but it's, it's not, integrated into Nix um, at this point at all, or not much. There is a little bit of work done, but it's, um, uh, but it's somewhat orthogonal to the workflow that I have uh, and many uh, .NET people have. And so I'm going to, I, I realized I have to actually speak about, I have to do something more about um, how to integrate the .NET platform into Nix so such that it is a workflow that, that might actually work for people who have to develop for .NET. So, um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to give an introduction on this, how I went about it. I want to, uh, again, repeat, I'm not an expert or in uh, Nix or F Sharp uh, yet. Uh, so I'm sharing my personal experience and impression, impressions that I gathered while um, having worked with it so far. And uh, yeah, my approaches obviously have a couple of rough edges, so uh, help me improve it if you can. And it's my also my first talk, so criticize me, but gently. <laughs> um, yeah, so what? Uh, let's explore some basic aspects of F Sharp. I think that's quite worthwhile because it's actually, um, even though it's uh, it comes from Microsoft, it's actually uh, quite a a nice language. It has some really beautiful parts. Uh, and yeah, that's something I would like to show you. Uh, then, um, yeah, let's briefly look at some uh, sharp code. Of, obviously, that makes sense in this kind of talk. And uh, I think what's more relevant to most of most people here uh, in the audience is um, uh, examine strategies how to package uh, applications and libraries um, for Nix, because I ended up doing quite a bit of work on that um, in the process of preparing the talk. Uh, and then, yeah, if we have some time, I can show you how I constructed this small service and my little hacky way of deploying it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what is F Sharp? It was developed in 2005 with Microsoft Research by Don Syme and maybe others, probably, actually. And it's basically a .NET implementation of the OCaml programming language. Uh, it's uh, functional first, strict, um, but actually a multi-paradigm programming language, meaning it integrates ob object orientation into it, uh, it's, um, uh, as well as functional um, uh, programming patterns. Um, it's a first-class citizen of the .NET ecosystem, so it has, yeah, it's fully supported. It can uh, talk to um, other uh, um, libraries written in other .NET languages, so the interop is very good and which lends itself to actually a really big ecosystem of existing code that is, um, and that's quite valuable. Um, yeah, uh, the, what it does, it compiles to um, bytecode and runs on the CLR, which is the runtime environment. Um, and this is kind of in so far relevant as that um, most of the ecosystem is revolving around these uh, DLLs, which is uh, which are compiled libraries, um, and uh, not much is compiled from source uh, when you uh, work with it. Oh, and it has um, um, ahead of time compilation. Um, with Mono, that means you can actually produce, similar to Haskell, you can produce um, more or less standalone applications. Um, with, yeah. 
Um, the ecosystem, it's free software. That's really great. Uh, it runs on Mono and on the core CLR, which is, was recently um, uh, open sourced by Microsoft. And both of which are already in Nix. So, uh, yeah, it's easy to get started. Uh, and it all feeds off the um, NuGet, NuGet package manager and repository, which is sort of, I, th I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's broken in a couple of ways, but it's actually the de facto standard for this, um, uh, for this development approach. So, yeah, you can't get around it. Um, yeah, what the pros that I found, um, uh, were, yeah, it has great integration with other languages. That means I can just, um, uh, have actually a mixed project that, um, that includes some C sharp code that I've written now and uh, I've written a couple of months ago. And now I start off, um, writing, um, uh, rewriting some bits of the, uh, the um, application in F sharp. So, um, I can actually reuse my code and that's really quite good. There, there are lots of good libraries. Um, uh, one of which, for example, is the Akkad.net library um, that I'm now starting to use, which sort of uh, is an implementation of some design patterns of the Erlang programming language in .NET. Uh, or recently there was, um, I stumbled across Embrace, which is a project to do um, uh, to uh, do computing, uh, do, do cloud computing, make it very easy. Uh, and yeah, uh, and there's the Web Sharper pro uh, um, project, for example, where you can compile F Sharp code directly to JavaScript, so you can develop your entire application in uh, F Sharp. So yeah, that also leads to the next point. It's a full stack language. You can just do everything with it, basically. Uh, and yeah, it's a good plan of principled and pragmatic approaches, which is actually can, is quite nice. So yeah, there are some cons that I found coming from Haskell, sort of, that uh, were, there's no type classes. So that makes, that makes you repeat or that makes you have to look for other strategies not to repeat yourself too much. Uh, and sometimes a bit noisy and quirky syntax, uh, I have to say. Uh, that's one of the main things that kind of uh, make me at flinch sometimes. Um, yeah, and then it does introduce some new nomenclature for um, rather common things like monads, calls them computation expressions, for example, which is, well, you have to get around in understanding it first. And it's impure. <laughs> that means you can, uh, yeah, you can basically do everything that you want inside a function. You, it, do, it does not guarantee you that you, that the function will only do what it's supposed to, what it says in the um, function, um, in the type uh, declaration. But <laughs> who cares? <laughs> it's not a big deal. I think it's good to look at some code. <laughs> um, so uh, there's the lambda calculus. So you can see um, you use let binding, you use let to bind top level variables. Uh, uh, as well as functions are declared the same way, and you can tell that is this this is the how you define um, the, the the input type for value, um, and this is uh, yeah the shorter version of it, and a partially applied version of the that function. So um, yeah, and this is function application in the end. Uh, quite comp compact. And yeah, uh, you can see this is a very common idiom in F sharp. You, uh, you will feed X to F in some way. And this is a very, uh, yeah, you see this, um, all the time, basically. Uh, yeah, if you want to construct a tree, um, that's how you would go about doing that. Um, you can see, um, that, uh, it's a recursive definition, um, with, 
yeah basically and um uh, yeah another example of this um uh, kind of type um some type is uh, i use this for example in this uh, application that i'm writing to model you can use this to model for all the states that your system your system can be in it's uh, actually quite uh, and then use pattern matching against that we'll I'll show a little example of that in a second um, yeah, this is what a record looks like in F sharp. Um, you, contrary to how uh, to how it works in Haskell, you actually um, this is not the name does not become um, a top level function, but is an uh, is used as um, you would say if P is a person, then you would call P dot name to get to the name, uh, uh, which is actually better than Haskell, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, there's a common option type, uh, you know, from Haskell as well. So, and uh, an alias for a tuple. So, yeah, that's quite, and it has classes, wow. <laughs> um, Actually, yeah, what can I say about this? Um, I mean, I guess you, you see, you, you define some fields here and assign some default values to it. And uh, as normally in .NET, you have these, or in C Sharp as well, you have these, you define properties, uh, which you can get in set. Uh, yeah, and yeah, some interaction with an instance of that class. Um, yeah, and pattern matching, which is uh, sort of a very nice way um, of uh, destructuring values, um, where you can uh, 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 match on the construct the, the data constructor of a type. In this case, an option type, uh, and it's um, in the value that it encapsulates, and do things based on that. Yeah, it has um, modules, also very nice. You, I mean, just like in most other program language, languages that are relevant. Um, I guess, actually, that's not true. But um, yeah, the modules, you declare them like this, and then you can have multiple of these in a file. Uh, and uh, Or you can use it in a top as um uh, as a top level declaration and you don't need all the indentation which um, but then it encompasses the entire file um, yeah and there are namespaces which are it's yeah it's uh, it's another way to make a top level uh, a namespace and then have subsequently more modules in there um, yeah, there are a bunch of cool things to that uh, could we could look at, but maybe it's actually um, yeah that I le leave to the reader, I suppose. Uh, which are type providers that are like a nice way to use reflection to um, uh, construct type safe. Um, uh, how do, yeah, uh, to construct type safe. Um, or to uh, pull out information from, for example, from a JSON, you pass it a JSON and it pulls out information about the structure of the JSON and um, gives you a way to cre create um, or pass those types of JSONs in a type safe way. Um, but there are yeah many different type providers out there. Um, yeah, monads or computation expressions in F sharp would be interesting to look at, but um, uh, uh, qu quotation in the reflection is actually quite nice because you can have compile time and also runtime meta programming. Um, and un units of measure are quite uh, deeply integrated into the language. Uh, also, mailbox processors, which is um, the actor model of programming that's actually, um, it comes with F sharp, which is a uh, quite nice way of structuring programs. And of course, yeah, asynchronicity is also something that's um, that has yeah, that's very well integrated. F sharp and Nix. Um, 
So F# -sharp is um, now is packaged separately from Mono, and it's after some research, this is actually meant. This is actually the right way to do it, um, even though in Windows it all gets uh, put into more or less the same folder structure, and and F# -sharp will have access. Um, to the uh, global assembly cache as well, but this is um, this is uh, uh, actually not so not recommended um, uh, uh, practice. So it's all it's actually fine the way it is in Nix. Uh, uh, it's also been recently updated to the latest version in Nix. So yeah, you can take advantage of that. Um, yeah, uh, as I already mentioned, um, usually package management in F# -sharp or in .NET is done um, with NuGet and your favorite IDE, and you don't actually do any of this manually, which makes it a really big pain. Because I don't usually, I don't really like using IDEs, and uh, and uh, that made me had. I had to switch back to Mono Develop um, in order to uh, uh, get started on a project on a different computer, or in order to update the dependencies. Also, um, the problem with NuGet is that uh, is is that you most IDEs manage dependencies on. And I guess I should say a word about how the projects are structured. They are usually you have a grand solution, and the solution can contain multiple projects. The, uh, the projects could be libraries or executables, and uh, NuGet manages um, dependencies on the project level, and not on. Uh, it can manage it also on the. On the solution level, but it's very finicky, and sometimes you end up having, uh, for example, a dependency on a JSON parser in one project that is much um, that is the, where the version is much older than in in another project of that same solution, and it's very messy. Uh, so NuGet is kind of terrible. Um, and yeah, NuGet is also uh, actually a web service that. That distributes uh, these um, DLLs, uh, these yeah, libraries um, of bytecode libraries. Um, but there is some um, very promising. There's a new tool called Paket uh, by Stefan Forkman, I think, and it's a yeah, it's it is sort of uh, it's a very good replacement or newer strategy to deal with package management for .NET packages and. Yeah, it fixes all um, all the problems associated with uh, with NuGet, um, in particular what I just mentioned, but also a bug in NuGet where NuGet would, um, if it can't decide on a particular version, it would just use the newest one by um, automatically and yeah, kind of can break your builds and uh, cause havoc. Um, Paket basically. Takes over um, the entire package management for the entire solution as well. It does. It uh, resolves. Um, it resolves dependencies globally, and then uh, distributes them to each, uh, or um, and then modifies each project such that it has always a, um, a, a consistent dependency uh, graph across the solution. Um, and I should show you, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I can show you uh, um, the XML. It's kind of not pretty, <laughs> uh, but basically, um, a project uh, in F# -sharp usually now with this packet workflow starts by um, uh, cloning this project scaffold, for, uh, and then you run a command build a build command and it will bootstrap everything for you and set it up. Uh, and then Paket um, uh, will take the Paket dependencies file and look into it, look which version, which packages you want and which versions of those and download them from NuGet. 
fix all the versions in uh, the paket log file, similar to uh, the uh, um, file.log, for example, for Rubyists, or I, th I think there might be similar um, uh, strategies out there uh, um, for other package managers. And then uh, we'll write, the, it will modify the project file, FS, the FS project file to uh, reflect where to find, to, to tell it where to find all the dependencies um, for that uh, project. And also it will create this paket template file. And um, yeah, uh, so then the build tool goes, uh, goes into, uh, it looks into the FS project file and looks where it finds all the um, references that are used in the project to uh, compile it and uh, it will find, okay, Paket has put them in this place and uh, yeah, it'll be able to do its job. But yeah, but how uh, does this, the big question then while I was sort of how, uh, uh, um, uh, working on this was how does how does this workflow, which is the recommended F# -sharp work, workflow nowadays, um, I guess, uh, how does that integrate with Nix? And at this point, uh, what we would need to do if we want to use Nix for package management, we would obviously need to um, yeah cre create and maintain all the packages for the NuGet dependencies. And um, I should say there has some work has already been done and. Um, but it's um, obviously because NuGet is a big repository. There's a lot of software uh, on it. Um, it's it's actually uh, quite a tedious task. I mean, to to get all of that reflected in, into the Nix uh, into Nix packages. Um, and then when if we had had all those packages, we need to find and do what Paket does and um, actually manipulate our project files and uh, and create the right references uh, to the dependencies in the project file uh, to, with basically the paths to the DLLs. Um, yeah, and then also in order to build it with Nix, we have to disable the automatic package restore, which is part of the build process, which new... Uh, uh, um, uh, which NuGet does. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, some work has already been done toward, but at this point, very few packages exist, unfortunately. And um, and the and uh, the problem because there is no automated way to um, manage these references in the project files. It's um, at this point. The, this approach is kind of orthogonal to how people, um, or at least I guess I'm talking, for, I'm talking for myself, but how I would want to work um, uh, effectively. So, yeah, there might not be enough incentives at this point to, um, yeah, uh, to do this, um, especially because, uh, yeah, the problem is that. You, we need a tool to uh, do all of this automatically, basically. Um, and yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, there is actually. Then when I when I when I was working on the example project for this talk, uh, which I'm probably not going to be able to show to you, <laughs> but um, I I figured that. Hey, I can look into Paket and see what does Paket do. What kind of APIs does Paket um, give me in order to uh, uh, maybe actually automate this whole process? And uh, yeah, this is the. I guess I already said this. Um, uh, so and and yeah, I discovered that. Uh, I could do this with Paket, and that's why I created this uh, tool uh, last week. Um, that automates the process. Um, so what it does, it uses the packet metadata um, that uh, in the packet.log file that uh, um, packet creates once you've um, in, uh, downloaded and installed all the dependencies for development. And it uh, it basically yeah it grabs all the dependencies out, out of there, um, uh, the specific versions. 
And then it also discovers um, the projects and uh, and um, uh, pulls out their metadata, i.e., for example, if I have a solution with a central library where all my um, uh, domain logic lives and my types, and I have, for example, and currently I'm doing the rewrite for our application and, and I have a, a module that uses Web Sharper to compile to JavaScript, <clears throat> it discovers that um, that uh, there are libraries and executables and it will be able to uh, uh, discover that and, uh, and create different Nix derivations for each. Um, in particular, just uh, uh, basically creates a wrapper script for exe executables. Um, yeah, so that's what it does. It generates Nix expressions for all the dependencies. And one one Nix expression per project. And then, um, yeah, creates wrappers, um, it creates the wrapper scripts uh, in the, um, so maybe I should show you this, but, ah, ah okay, oh, oh no. I might need this now. Ah. Okay. Uh, let's make it a bit bigger. So this is the project. Um, you can see the uh, the project layout. Um, here is, a, is, the, is the central sort of build file and source and tests and so on. And all packages land in here. So that's, that's what Paket does. And uh, Paket.2 uh, Nix has some dependencies I can show you quickly. Uh, Paket.dependencies. And you can see, yes, I depend on Paket core and I had to pin the version because I, there are some additions to the public API that I needed to make in order to get this working. Um, yeah, and maybe show you the in the source for the paket.nix um, executable. Uh, you can see there is a reference as file. Ah, no. Paket references. And what I use is I use Paket Core. Obviously, that's my main dependency. And F Sharp Core, because uh, actually I don't need that, strictly speaking, anymore. Uh, and this Paket template file, which is also in every, uh, every uh, top level, uh, in every project in a solution, um, you can, there's, uh, there's some metadata specified for that particular pa package. So um, if I went on to Nixify this project, um, uh, then what I would do is I would build it first, uh, obviously. And there's all kinds of stuff happening. Hope it builds. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes, I don't have internet. That's bad. <laughs> uh, oops, sorry. <clears throat> then, then this will actually fail. I'm sorry, um, because what Paket.nix does uh, is it um, actually it goes through all the projects, gets all that metadata, and then it goes on to new, the NuGet new get repo repository to download all the packages and create the SHA 256 sums for it. But um, yeah, I can't access it. For, uh, that's um, unfortunate. <laughs> I wish I could have shown you. But anyways, uh, and once this process is done, there's a, a Nix directory with the top level with a top level Nix expression that um, that I can execute to install 
uh, the um, project into to build and install the project and its dependencies into the store. And um, <coughs> yes, so uh, actually, and um, yeah, this is my sort of this was the main outcome for, of my research for this talk was basically okay. I shouldn't really talk about necessarily about how to create a service, which I did though, and I, I can show you, but um, make this proposition that this could be actually quite a viable way of working um, with .NET on Nix, and um, and it would actually uh, and it could be an approach how to uh, start um, uh, getting the .NET um, platform, getting better integration for the .NET platform on uh, into uh, into Nix, and which I think is 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 good because sometimes you have to write software for it, like I do, and uh, it's not too bad. And uh, I think there's some value to it, um, but um, yeah. I think since I, I wish I could show it to you, but uh, since I can't, uh, maybe I can show you quickly the uh, example project. Um, yeah, it's actually my uh, the example project was. Um, well, the, the first the sequence of events was that I built first the example, and then I thought, oh yeah, now I just need to create a package for it and 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 uh, and think about how to deploy it. Uh, but then I realized that it wasn't actually as easy to to get it into the store uh, as I thought it would be. Uh, so, but the project was built around the idea of using um, full text indexer into um, uh, and build a little API to um, search uh, into all the nice um, uh, functional programming uh, papers that are on my hard drive, courtesy of Oli, actually. He has a very nice repo of papers. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, I built this little indexer, and we can it can quickly sh um, show you what it does. Uh, source paper scraper is the name, and it's uh, I can show you the types first. So, or actually, maybe I should show you the tool itself. It it uses recall to in. Uh, um, to index the papers, and there you can see this is how you would use it from the command line, and uh, uh, and it has this kind of output. <laughs> uh, normally, there's a GUI that you use with this, but um, uh, so um, I have I modeled this uh, in terms of. Um, a result row, which has, um, and I, I just focused on the abstract file name, MIME type, and um, the location of the file, and uh, and the overall query result with some metadata, and uh, yeah, so. I had to implement a parser for it, and this is also something quite nice, um, I guess, is that there is a really nice parser um, called F uh, Parsec, which modeled after Haskell's uh, um, Parsec library, roughly. And this is what uh, a parser would look like. Uh, and in the end, I just skip ahead a little bit. In the end, it uh, this is basically passing the result here. It just goes ahead and says, "Okay, look for an abstract line, look for a file name line, a mime tape, a char set, and a URL line, and then feed that into make row." And that is a function here that uh, returns a record. Um, with all these fields, 
And then down here, there's just some wiring up where I start the uh, command line process and um, uh, uh, return a list of that type of the uh, actually yeah um, um, result and I just show you what it does quickly. Um, uh, there's the service and. Um, now I need to get this across there, I guess. Oops. Uh, that's actually, let me do this. Do I see here? Uh, I need to start it again. No. Okay. And then here I can use curl and say, okay, I want to search for everything. Uh, for example, and feed that into a pretty printer. Python, M, I, Jason, Yeah, and you see, um, <laughs> you have a little API uh, for the full text indexer. Uh, into the all these nice papers. Yes, um, I think since I couldn't, um, I think the takeaway that I would like to probably propose is that um, is that it's F sharp is actually a really nice language in my opinion, and quite a few other people that exist and uh, that think the same. And I think it would be nice to have better support uh, in uh, Nix for it. Um, and I, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to um, yeah, feedback, but also to improving yeah, my approach to it, maybe with your feedback. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, maybe now would be the time. Okay, so we have uh, only one and a bit of a minute left, so we can only have one question. Yeah, so you created this packet to Nix uh, generator. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, great work. Uh, I was actually curious uh, uh, on how you, uh, for example, deal with the DLLs. Because uh, some time ago, I also uh, tried supporting uh, uh, the Visual Studio infrastructure on Windows with Nix. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things I, I uh, found particularly tedious is how to load DLLs from arbitrary locations in a Nix store. Have you also uh, dealt with this problem? And yes, what, uh, what it, yes, um, it actually automates this, um, it uses Paket to discover what the dependencies are and automates the process of creating Nix derivations for each of the uh, dependencies. And because Paket actually manages, um, uh, um, Paket basically puts everything into this packet package directory and uh, the derivations um, the uh, the derivation for the program that you wrote uh, expects has a section where it references each dependency in that package directory and what it does is that uh, it creates um, a package for the uh, for the uh, DLL and then uh, symlinks that into this package directory at build time, and that's yeah, that's how it works. I wish I could show you; it would be nice. But uh, I thought I'd have internet. But yeah, that, that's how it, that's how it works. Okay, thanks for the talk, Carsten. Um,